Good afternoon. Well, I have, uh, we are starting a little bit later than usual today, and I have a lot to cover in a little time. So let's uh, bow our heads, have a word of prayer, and begin immediately. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love for us. Father, I ask today that you would please speak to us. Help us, Lord, to hear what you have to say. Father, we, as we deal with this uh, issue of music today, Lord, help us humble our hearts that we may be open to the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. I will probably just be quoting verses for you instead of asking you to turn so that we can get through this. You will remember, by the way, the name of this message this uh, afternoon is entitled Holy Rebellion. Holy Rebellion. You will remember that in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, we have been reading uh, um, about this, this, this angel in heaven by the name of Lucifer who began a rebellion, began a revolt. And we understand that according to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23, the Bible tells us rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, is as the sin of witchcraft. And we might rightly conclude that the first rebellion or the first revolution took place in heaven. And let me say this, Satan was the instigator of the very first revolution. Satan is into revolutions. Did you know that? Satan is into revolutions. What is a revolution? It is an attempt to overthrow an established government for the setup of a new one. That's what a revolution is. We read in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 12 yesterday, that uh, Lucifer, or rather that the Bible says there that the throne of God or the sanctuary is, is God's high throne from the very beginning. We understand that in heaven, there was a sanctuary, and this was the white house of the universe from where God ruled. And we also learned that Satan, in beginning this rebellion, recruited one-third of holy angels. Now, I'm going to read to you a verse from the book of Isaiah chapter 14, and I want to show you just how it is that Lucifer was able to convince one-third of the angels. Before I read that, remember that we learned in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer uh, was thrown out of heaven, the Bible says, because something was found in him. What was that thing? Iniquity. Iniquity. In Matthew 24, verse 12, the Bible tells us, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will do what? Wax cold. Now, the word there for iniquity in Matthew 24, verse 12, is the Greek word anomia. Can you say that word with me? Anomia. What does that sound like to you? What word does that sound like to you? (laughs) Ammonia. (laughs) Okay, it sounds like ammonia, but that's not the word I'm looking for. The word I'm looking for is, is antinomianism. Anybody ever heard that word? Antinomianism means against the what? Against the law. So, beloved, it's interesting that the first antinomian was who? Was Satan. And as we look at the the, the rebellion that is going on on earth now, what is that rebellion against? It is against the law of God. Now, remember, the law of God is the very foundation of God's throne or of God's rulership. So when the devil was was attacking the sanctuary or the throne of God, he was attacking the very law of God. Now, it's very interesting because in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the clouds of the high, of the. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, now watch this. On one end, Lucifer is saying we don't need a law. 
That was his argument in heaven. There is no need for a law. Iniquity means lawlessness or against the law. And Lucifer was against the law of God. However, at the very same time, Lucifer was saying, I will be like who? Question, what is the most high like? If someone was walking down the street and stopped you and said, hey, can you tell me what the Most High is like? What would be the first thing that came out your mouth? The Most High is what? He is good. He is love. It, oh, guys, come on. Yes, he is love. He is, he is wonderful. He is merciful. He is kind. These are the attributes of the Most High. Now watch this, beloved. What was Lucifer saying when he said, I will be like the Most High? Lucifer was saying... I can be good, loving, merciful, kind, without having a law to tell me how to do it. Okay, did you catch that? See, see, the book of Psalms 77 verse 13 tells us, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. But Lucifer, what he was saying was, look, God, don't tell me that there's only one way to be righteous. You don't have the market on righteousness. There are other ways to be righteous. We can be righteous, holy, loving, kind without you telling us how to do it. And beloved, this is why it is, it is, I call it a holy rebellion. Because Lucifer, had he come to the angels and said, who wants to be evil? They would have said, you can go do that by yourself. We're not going for that. But the argument was, hey, look, I'm not trying to, you know, cause trouble. I'm just saying there are other ways to be righteous. In essence, beloved, what Lucifer was attempting to do was to decentralize the sanctuary. Decentralize the power of of God, decentralize the authority of God so that there could, other, there could be other ways opened up for one to be righteous where God wasn't the only one in charge. Does that make sense? Lucifer was out to decentralize the power of God's authority. And this is why one third of holy angels fell for the lie because it was brought to them under the disguise of righteousness. Now, I want to give you a couple examples in scriptures, and I'm not going to have time to go there. But how many of you remember the story of Korah? Korah. Korah rose up against Moses as they were in the wilderness. And you'll remember, Korah says something very interesting here. Let me, let me just find it and read it for you. Numbers chapter 16 talks about Korah, and he rose up, verse 2, they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. That means they were honorable men. And notice what verse 3 says, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Okay, you didn't catch it. Korah is about to lead a rebellion against Moses. And if you read the rest of the story, what happens? The ground opens up and swallows up Korah for his rebellion. But what kind of rebellion did Korah lead? It was a holy rebellion. Moses, why are you lifting yourself up above the people? Don't you see that all these Israelites are holy? Were they holy? (laughs) You know the stories. But it was a holy rebellion. Rebellion, and many of the Israelites fell for it. Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. We read there that sorcery would be the means by which the whole world will be deceived. You'll remember that that word sorcery, the Greek is pharmakia, and the... the, the, the Meaning of the word is this, anything that medicates the what? Mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God. Can we assume then or rightly come to the conclusion that sorcery was taking place in heaven among the angels? 
Let me ask you, what is it that Lucifer had to change about the angels in order for them to get on his side? He had to change their, their minds. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? Raise your hands, because I need to know if you're ready before I move any further. All right. I'm going to substitute a word for mind, because when we talk about the mind, we're actually talking about the what? The, <laughs> okay, we have doctors in here, the brain, no. We're, we're, we're talking about the, <laughs> the thoughts. Amen? Anything that medicates the thoughts so that it will not follow the will or the law of God. The devil had to change the thoughts, the thinking of the angels in order for them to get on his side. He had to cause them to see things his way. Now I'm going to substitute a word for thoughts. Are you ready? The devil had to change the musings of the angels. What word did I just say? What is what does musing mean anyway? What does it mean to muse? It means to what? To think. So let's go back to Revelation 18.23. Sorcery is anything that medicates our musings. Ah. (laughs) Anything that medicates our musings so that we will ultimately rebel against the government of God. In other words, anything that medicates our musings so that we begin to see or attempt to uh, to participate in this decentralizing of the government and the order of God. The final rebellion on planet Earth. The devil realizes that he must change the musings of God's people. Yes, yes, yes. Can I have fun with this? (laughs) He will have to attempt to change the way God's people muse about things. And and incidentally, beloved, we ask the question, hmm, Lucifer, which way, what could be, what could possibly be one of the ways in which the devil will attempt to change the musings of God's people, of God's jury in the last days? And I want to present to you this afternoon that the devil in the last days will use music. In an attempt to change the musings of God's people. And so you understand that music, by definition, is the art of expressing one's thoughts and feelings. Did you realize that? That's what music is. Music is the expression of the way one is thinking and what? Feeling. And then we add words to those to to, to that music, and it is it is the total expression of one's musings. Let me ask you: do you think it is possible? That the devil could infuse certain music with his musings in an attempt to change the musings of God's people. What do you think? I think so. I think so. But the problem is, beloved, is that, as I said before, for every genuine, there are two counterfeits. One for the world... But the church usually doesn't fall for that stuff. You know, that's blatant evil. So the devil Christianizes or brings about a holy (laughs) rebellion. A holy revolution. Now, beloved, how many of you remember the story of of, uh, Samuel 
when, when Saul, or Saul rather, when Samuel told him, Samuel, uh, 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 God told him that he was to wipe out this whole nation for the evil and the wicked they had done. And we talked about this the other day, that what did Saul do? He kept some of the stuff. You remember that? Now, now it's interesting, beloved, because what, what Saul did in particular was he kept some sheep. He kept some sheep. And when Samuel comes and Samuel's about to rebuke him and Saul says, all that you have said I have done, I've gotten rid of all the stuff of the enemy. Let me tell you, beloved, when you become a Christian, you're supposed to get rid of all the stuff of the enemy. Everything. Everything. (laughs) Nothing is to be left behind. But, But Saul kept some of the sheep. Now, now, beloved, it's interesting when you read the account, when Samuel comes on the scene, Samuel says this, what meaneth this bleating in my ear? And, and I may call this message, what meaneth this bleeding? <laughs> and I said, hmm, Lord, let me look up this word bleeding. And you know what the word bleeding is? In the Hebrew, kol kol, it is used also to represent song. What meaneth this bleeding? And I can imagine Saul saying, well, Lord, uh, you know, Samuel, this is sheep music. (laughs) Yeah, I have a creative imagination, you know, so. Beloved, what else is interesting about this is that when you take the same word, the same word is found in the book of Exodus chapter 32, when, when, when Moses had went up to the mountain, the children of Israel turned to, to Aaron and said, Aaron, build us a calf. And so Aaron built this calf, and in Exodus 32, verse 5, guess what Aaron said? Today is a feast that we are dedicating unto the Lord. Did you hear that? Aaron takes this golden calf and says, it's Babylonian, but we're going to take it and use it for God's glory. And when Moses comes down, Moses says, I hear the sound of war. And the same word for sound is the word kol kol used back in, I hear the music of war. Holy Rebellion, beloved, when we take that which belongs to the devil and attempt to sanctify it by giving it to God, it is, in essence, a holy rebellion. And now I want to talk to you for a little while about contemporary. (laughs) Contemporary Christian music. Now, now, if you were here last night, you heard the whole message about the music itself, about the rhythms, about, about rock, about rap, about jazz, about R&B. And we learned the origin of these musics. We learned that they came out of the abyss. Very good. If you weren't there last night, you need to get the message. But now we want to take a look, beloved, at Christian R&B and Christian rock and Christian rap. And Christian jazz. (laughs) And what we're going to do is instead of looking at the music itself, we just want to see what are the musings of contemporary Christian music. That's all you want to know. What are the musings? What do the artists themselves say about contemporary Christian music? And to do that, I've got like a ton of quotes. Usually this would take me about an hour to do, and I have very little time. So I'm just going to read maybe one or two quotes. And what I want to share with you, beloved, is that contemporary Christian music has a four-pointed philosophy. How many? Four, four points of philosophy that, they, that, that represents their musings. Let's see what these four points are. Number one, contemporary Christian music. And when I say contemporary, I want you to understand that I do not mean modern music. I'm talking about about R&B, rap, rock. You know, if you love uh, 50 Cent, you ever seen that in in the Christian music store? If you love 50 Cent, then you love this. 
Now, what do you do in loving 50 Cent as a Christian? And how do they know what 50 Cent, this artist, how does he know what 50 Cent sound like so that he can imitate him? Who are your favorite artists listening to? Huh. Didn't think about that one, Pastor. And so, and so, number one, point number one of contemporary Christian music is that they are anti-establishment. I'm talking about anti-church establishment. I will not read these names. I'm just going to read one or two quotes to you under this principle. Here we go. This is a contemporary Christian music artist. Listen. I found out that church really wasn't the place where I had more freedom. It was the opposite. I actually was restricted more, and I always felt like I was swimming upstream in that environment. I guess the main thing is I want to grow as an artist, and I want to be able to write whatever I want to write about. And I really don't want to be restricted. And f- uh, I really don't want to be restricted. The Born Again movement is about obsession and narrow-mindedness and repression. And true Christianity is about mercy and freedom and love. Now you tell me, coming from a Christian musical artist speaking about the church of God. And what is the church of God? It is his central place of power. Where? On this earth. Let me read another one. One advantage of moving past the old government model of the church is that it is less important for the pastor to have the authority. It's not natural for the church to try to force people with that governmental mode of spiritual leadership. And the quote goes on. In other words, beloved, what this gentleman here is seeing is that, is that uh, we need to come to a place where we have a revolution. And get rid of that old governmental model of church where the pastor has the authority. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does the pastor have authority in the church? Because of the word of God. Not because of who I am or who the pastor is. A pastor has authority as long as he is speaking from what? This book. So to challenge then the authority of a pastor, listen, is not really challenging the pastor if he's speaking the truth. It is challenging the what? The word. Now don't get me wrong. I know that there may be some pastors who are not speaking truth. That's not what I'm talking about. But beloved, you see here this anti-establishment theme that is present among the artists of contemporary Christian music. Not only are they anti-establishment, they're also anti-rule. Listen, in the church I grew up in, you couldn't go to movies. You couldn't go to dances. dances. There were a lot of thou's and thou shalt nots. Now let me ask you, where does thou and thou shalt not come from? The Ten Commandments. That's interesting. Let's get rid of all these, all these laws. Here, here's another one. And this, if I name this guy, you would know right who he is right off the bat, every single one of you. You are always going to have those very conservative people. They say you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't drink. You can't smoke. It's a pretty bizarre way of thinking. Contemporary Christian music artists. Anti-establishment, anti-law, and number three, they are anti-evangelism. Listen, here's one artist. He says, I'm a singer, not a preacher. I'm not looking to convert anybody. (laughs) Contemporary Christian musicians. And beloved, if I were to read all the quotes on this page, you would see that there is this theme about don't be so preachy. Have you heard it? Don't be so preachy in your music. You know, preachiness turns people off. Beloved, what has God called us to do? He's called us to preach the word. And so with these artists who are saying, hey, you know what? We're not going to talk about Jesus so much in our lyrics, even though it's it's supposed to be Christian music. We don't want to come off preachy. Let me tell you, when I was in the hip-hop industry and we were known as a Christian uh, Christian hip-hop group, you know what the magazines like Rolling Stones and... and, 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 uh, Vibe magazine would write about us. They're cool because they're not preachy. And I remember looking at that and saying, "Ah, something's kind of wrong with this. I can't put my finger on it. 
God was bringing me into more light. But beloved, the purpose is so that we, hey, don't be so preachy. Just enjoy the music. And by the way, what is the music? It is that syncopated rhythm of rock, of, of rock rap, R&B that we learned yesterday comes from the abyss. We learned yesterday has that hypnotic influence, has that influence. By the way, did you know that that music, remember we talked about rebellion last night? And we saw how that music always leads to rebellion. Rebellion against parents, re- rebellion in the world. That music leads to rebellion against the government. How many of you see that? Come on, think about it. Think about the 60s. It was rebellion against the establishment. It was all about free love, do whatever you want. You know, remember, you remember that? Now, beloved, what happens when you bring that same music into the church? Come on. Holy rebellion. Free love. Don't talk so much about the law of God. Jesus loves you just as you are and you can relax. It's free love. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say or how you look or how you act. Free love. Holy rebellion. People are tired of Christian songs. I better save that one. Let me go to number four quickly. Anti-establishment, anti-law, anti, what was number three? Anti-evangelism, and number four, anti-distinction. Listen, I have a healthy sense of right and wrong. But sometimes, for example, using foul exclamation point words among friends can be for a good laugh. You you didn't didn't hear that. (laughs) It seems to me that people who are most adamantly adamantly against premarital sex have experienced some kind of pain in their own lives. Like the people who say absolutely no to rock and roll, chances are it has something to do with a past sadness. I want to read to you the lyrics of a song. I'm not going to tell you who wrote this song. Everybody do the twist. The mashed potato, it goes like this. The funky chicken, monkey too. There wasn't nothing they wouldn't do. But there's a new dance now no one can stop. A leap for joy. We call it the Holy Ghost Hop. Now get ready. Hold steady. Don't deny it. Just try it. Be bold now. Let it go. Let it go now. Give the Holy Ghost control now. Hey, all you brothers and you sisters too, don't let tradition tell you what to do. Now, beloved, I want you to to, 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 to listen to this this, this, this incredible... ah, The only difference between rock and Christian rock is the lyrics, and then the difference is sometimes subtle. And the basic root, at the basic root, there's no difference. Christianity is about rebellion. Jesus Christ is the biggest rebel to ever walk the face of the earth. He was crucified for his rebellion. Rock and roll is about the same thing. Rebellion. To me, rock and the church go hand in hand. Now, beloved, I love rock music. You, 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 I think you begin to understand me now. I love rock music, beloved. And you ought to love rock music too, amen? Uh, <laughs> they didn't get it, man. <laughs> That's right. The, the rock is Jesus. Rock music is old, beloved. It was around during the time of the children of Israel. It's old, but the devil has come up with a counterfeit rock music. And then has attempted to bring it in the church to supplant the rock. Jesus Christ. 
So now, watch this. Good, I actually think I'm going to make it now. When we bring in these people into the church, what happens? We have brought in a people who were brought in under a particular musing. Did you get that? They weren't preached to. There was no e- evangelism. Uh, uh, we didn't tell them you had to you know, belong to a particular establishment. And we tried to say, hey, come as you are. Are you being slow this morning? <laughs> this afternoon? Oh, man. Come as you are. And beloved, as these people come into the church, what, in order to keep them now, we can't suddenly flip the switch and now go, establishment. Here are the laws. Uh, 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 you know, there is a difference between right and wrong. We can't do that. Why? Because that's not who we brought in. And so now you have in this church a war of two musings. Two different groups now, and and one group is saying, you know what, we want to bring about a revolution. We are tired of this old governmental way of thinking. We are tired. This is not just your your this is not just rebellion, this is holy rebellion. We're gonna do things our way. We're gonna reach them our way. We're not gonna use the word of God to preach. We're gonna sing them into the church. We're gonna rock them into the church. We're gonna wrap them into the church. And beloved, what you find happening before our very eyes is what I call holy rebellion. This is for the good of this is this is for God. This is holy work. We are doing this for a good cause. Beloved, I want you to think and think very carefully. Let me say this. Jesus was indeed the biggest rebel that ever lived on planet Earth. And we can say amen to that. (laughs) And uh, I want to make a call for some rebels today. (laughs) Rebels against the system of this world. Rebels against the darkness of this world. Beloved, let me tell you, I'm a rebel. Okay. (laughs) I am in rebellion against the, the system of this world. I'm in rebellion against the kingdom of Satan and darkness and his principles. So, yeah. And you know what God is needing right now? He's needing more people who are willing to rebel against the ways of this world. Anybody interested in rebelling against the ways of this world? Beloved, as the rebellion goes forward, do you realize how music has been played, the the role music has played in bringing about revolutions? All throughout the ages? And the devil knows it's no different in the church. And beloved, I believe that what we need is a counter-revolution. You know what that is, right? It's a revolution against the revolution. It's a rebellion against the rebellion. And beloved, I believe that God is calling a people to say, listen, let me read to you. Closing quote. First selected messages, page 205. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engage in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be counted as error. A new organization would be established. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of the system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that, the, that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Attempting to be holy 
without God telling us how. Attempting to be righteous. There are other ways to worship God. You don't have the only way. How, how that is so, what audacity to think that that is the only way that we can worship God. So if I want to bring my drum here and worship God with my drum, how dare you tell me? <clears throat> Not rebellion. Nobody would go for that. But holy rebellion? Yeah, we can get behind that. Holy rebellion. How do we bring about this counter-revolution? We bring it about with the word of God. Amen. Amen. We preach the word of God. Amen. How do we win people into the church? With what? The word of God. Do you realize that as this music spreads, less and less people know about the word of God? As more and more young people go, Lord, I'm crying. The music just moves me. Hey, can you tell me about 1844? Uh, uh, what was that again? Was that when Moses? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Our young people are becoming less and less literate upon the word of God as this holy rebellion gains momentum. So let me ask you, how many of you want to rebel? Rebel against the rebellion. Amen? Amen. I wish I had more time to really expound on this, and I really ran through this. I pray if you have any questions, you can talk to me afterwards. I will be here or write your question down, whatever, and and we will get to it. And thank you again for all being here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, uh, again, I pray that this may have been spoken in love. Lord, that uh, I'm not condemning anyone. But, Lord, I just pray that you would all just humble our hearts that we may hear and understand and seek out the truth with all our hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 